Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 175 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for this interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined by spirits pioneer and aquavit maker, Christian Krogstad, creator of Krogstad Aquavit. Oh yeah, he also created um, Aviation Gin, you may have heard of it. We're here, though, to talk specifically about Aquavit, the traditional Nordic spirit that walks and talks a little bit like gin while following a few of its own unique botanical rules. But before we launch our long ships on seas perfumed by caraway and dill, let's take a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Norwegian Paralysis. Developed by Martin Kate of Smuggler's Cove fame, it's a relatively low ABV tiki drink that gives Aquavit a chance to stretch its tropical legs. To make it, you'll need one and a half ounces of fresh orange juice, one and a half ounces of fresh pineapple juice, a half ounce of fresh lemon juice, quarter ounce of two to one Demerara syrup, a quarter ounce of Orgeat, and one and a half ounces of Aquavit. Combine these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, give them a good hard shake until you can start to hear and feel the texture change and then the tin begin to frost. Then strain into a highball glass over ice and top it all off with a nice aromatic garnish. Some versions of this drink call for cracked or cube ice, some call for crushed. Some call for a garnish of mint and others for a lemon wedge speared with a cocktail pick. So if we're taking our cues from the internet on this one, it seems like the main requirement for this drink is to get it all mixed up and then follow your heart when it comes to service style. Just a few things I want to point out about this drink formulation. First, you'll notice that there's only about a half ounce of sweeteners in the form of Orgeat and rich Demerara syrup. Usually you see more syrups being used in tiki, but in the Norwegian paralysis, you've got plenty of sweetness from the orange and pineapple juice, so you don't need much more. Also, I love the lemon gesture. Most of the time, tiki cocktails rock the lime or the grapefruit, but here I imagine the lemon pairing with the aqua vee to conjure up sensory images of the seafood that so often accompanies a snops of this botanical spirit. So, now that you've got a high latitude tropical cocktail to warm you up this January, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this Aquavit-driven conversation with Christian Krogstad, creator of Krogstad Aquavit, some of the topics we discuss include What differentiates Aquavit from other botanical spirits like gin and Geneva? How Christian noticed an impending gap in Aquavit imports and used it as an opportunity to develop and launch his own brand? The place that this Nordic spirit holds in Scandinavian cuisine and culture, including which foods to pair it with? a few cocktails to play around with as you begin to build out your own Aquavit collection at home, what to drink with a college-age Stephen Hawking, and much, much more. Christian is a real industry pioneer, whether you're talking about beer, gin, whiskey, or indeed Aquavit. He's really great at explaining both production nuances and flavor characteristics, and I'm thrilled to have gotten an hour of his time and expertise. With that, please enjoy this Aquavit Crash Course with distiller and pickled herring enthusiast, Christian Krogstad. Christian, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, let's just kick this off by having you introduce yourself and uh, just tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do. All right. I'm Christian Krogstad. I'm the founder, master distiller at House Spirits and Westward uh, Whiskey in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so, you know, a little of the background, I'm originally from Seattle. I uh, grew up in the Seattle area of Norwegian heritage. My, you know, family's originally from Norway, but, you know, came through Minnesota, which is sort of a ghetto of Norway, I guess, and a uh, big Norwegian community there, then moved out to Seattle in the 50s. 
And so that's where I was raised, a big Norwegian community, and, and really grew up, you know, eating the foods and drinking the beverages. And so, you know, a strong Norwegian connection. And that's uh, kind of what led me to Akavit eventually. But, you know, in the 80s, Seattle was a big center of the craft brewing movement, was a, you know, where one of the spots where it really started in the early 80s. And, and I was a big fan, enthusiast, home brewer. Um, I moved to Portland in 1991 to become a professional brewer. So I've been in, you know, beverage alcohol, either breweries, wineries, distilleries for uh, 30 years. I think my that my 30 year anniversary is in about two months. Wow. Um, so I moved to Portland. Uh, my initial uh, uh, passion uh, was beer, still is. I, I love great beer. I love great wine, love great spirits, but moved to Portland to become a brewer. At the time in 91, there were more breweries in Portland than anywhere in the States. I think there were 14, uh, and that was a lot. Now there's, you know, 90 or something like that. But um, yeah, moved there in 91, uh, got a job right away in a, in a brew pub working, making beer. I uh, went to brewing school in Chicago in 93, to the Siebel Institute uh, diploma program there. And I uh, stayed in the you know beer industry uh, until early 2000s. My final job in brewing, I, I was managing a brewery where the owners had, had built a little distillery there to make whiskey. And I saw what was involved in making whiskey, really wanted to do that. So I left that uh, and started working on a business plan for a a distillery. You know, the original plan, like I said, was to make whiskey, but uh, I, you know, in writing a business plan for that, I realized that uh, it would require a tremendous amount of, uh, of capital uh, to start. Uh, and so uh, we got into business in 2004, you know, with the intent of making whiskey and we did make whiskey, but we need, we needed to make um, clear spirits, you know, to, keep the lights on to pay the bills while we were waiting for the whiskey to age. So we made a couple, we made a gin called aviation gin. We made a aquavit called Krogstad aquavit. Since my family's Norwegian, we just named it after myself. Um, and that's kind of the, the trajectory started the distillery in 2004. Um, uh, we launched the gin, I think in 2006, early 2006, uh, Launched the Aquavit in early 2007, um, and uh, got got whiskey out. You know, a couple of years after that, and been r- rocking since. So that's that's in a nutshell. Brings us to the future. Um, we still make whiskey. We still make the aviation gin. We still make the Krogsta Aquavit, um, and it's all out there. You can try it all. Yeah. Uh... Aviation gin. That's, that's a fun one. I mean, we could have, we could have a whole podcast just on aviation gin for folks who don't know. Obviously we got Ryan Reynolds coming in, throwing, throwing some money at that brand, which is, it has to be nice. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lovely product. It's, it's one of my favorite citrus forward gins. Um, you know, it's, it's very, you know, my, my wife, uh, is, is a, is a big fan of aviation uh, yeah. and, you know, so, so obviously, uh, we, we tend to have, uh, if not aviation on hand, uh, then, then something close to it. And, and it's, I would say it's on hand more often than not in, in our household. So yeah, that, that's, that's exciting. It, I, I mean, the thing is, you know, you and I could have a conversation about, distilling, we could have a conversation about entrepreneurship. Uh, But what I want to focus on in this interview is actually a subject that we've sort of neglected on this podcast for the 170 or so episodes that we've done so far, and that is the Aquavit. And um, I'm I'm dying to dig into it. and, And I especially... I'm curious to to hear your take on it because you are someone who has also brought a gin to market. And so there's there, you know, I, I make bitters and so the botanicals and, you know, the, the way to get the flavors of botanicals into an ethanol base is something that is that I'm concerned with on a on a daily or weekly basis. So I'm, I'm just interested. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you might just kick us off on the Aquavit side of things by giving us a working definition and maybe just helping us understand how it arose as a spirits category, because I, I know people are familiar with gin and possibly even uh, Geneva, but, but Aquavit 
doesn't always get pulled into that side of the conversation. So I'm curious to hear your take. Yeah. So, you know, Akavit is, is, um, I guess indigenous. It's, uh, it, you know, the style comes from Scandinavia. It's made in, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, Iceland now as well. Uh, and you know, it's the traditional beverage, uh, you know, spiritus beverage from those countries. Um, and, and I think it has a similar trajectory to what gin, uh, had, I think, uh, you know, especially before column distillation, uh, when you're pot distilling and, and if you don't have good control of, you know, they didn't understand, uh, really understand fermentation until, you know, 150 years ago, hundred years ago. And uh, I think that what led to the popularity of gin and aquavit and so forth is originally just making really rough spirit and covering up that some of those rough flavors with botanical influences. Um, you know, an alternate take on that is that it, you know, it was medicine, you know, it was a way to take your medicine and that's kind of where the bitters comes from. Um, but there, you know, the, the, in simple terms, you know, aquavit is sort of the Danish term, aquavit, uh, aquavit, all are sort of interchangeable terms in Scandinavia, and it just means water of life, same as uh, whiskey uh, is a, you know, Gaelic bastardization of water of life. Uh, Eau de vie is the French water of life. And, and really, back in the, you know, back in the day, everything was water of life, and it was just the local interpretation of it. Um, and, you know, they didn't really understand distillation, it was kind of magical. So it was, it was, it was all water of life. And, and in, you know, for a practical definition and a sort of historical definition in Scandinavia, uh, you know, it is typically, you know, people make it at home by in simple infusion, like, like you do with bitters, but usually the larger companies like Alborg or Linea or OP Anderson and so forth will do a infusion and then a redistillation. And that's a way of really capturing the essential oils, uh, by redistillation, all those bitter and astringent elements that you get from a bitters uh, are not volatile. So those stay behind in the pot. When you redistill it, you just capture the the essential oils. And so that's what, for instance, uh, you know, a London dry gin is is starts with uh, a maceration and then a redistillation. And you're you're that's why it's floral and kind of got that pretty quality, but without being bitter. And so Akavit is, commercial Akavit is typically produced in the same manner. And just just to clarify really quickly, uh, you mentioned a couple of different words for Aquavit, uh, and I just wanted to make sure that there are no, uh, I've, I've recently been thinking a lot about uh, geographic indications. That there, is there any country that has um, sort of like a, a, a market cornered on Aquavit versus Akvavit? Not that I'm aware. Of. I, I don't think so. Let's just put it that way. I don't <laughs> think so. I would be surprised. You know, and I'm not... Um, I'm not necessarily a, a student of Aquavit history, just like I wasn't a student of gin history. You know, I love London dry gin. I, I love Scandinavian Aquavit. But something I learned from the brewing world in the you know 80s and 90s was, you know, nobody wants the American version of some European classic. You know, if you want Burton on Trent Pale Ale, go buy Burton on Trent Pale Ale. Uh, in the U.S., you know, the, the advantage of being a, a new industry in the region is that you get to innovate and you get to kind of rethink what you're doing and, and put your own spin on it. And so, you know, so for instance, with Aviation Gin, we didn't want to make London Dry Gin. We wanted to make our own spin on it. Uh, that's why it's different. Uh, and then with the Krogstad Akavit, same thing. We didn't, we didn't want to copy anyone. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, Scandinavian Akavits as as inspiration, as kind of benchmarks, but then we wanted to, you know, we wanted to make American Akavit. Clearly, there's a, there's a, a history and a, you know, a, a pattern that we can look at, but, but we wanted to do our own thing. And so, you know, in Scandinavia, the legal definition, really, uh, the EU standard is that it has to have either, um, juniper or sorry either caraway or um 
dill seed in it. Uh, it can have either or both. And then after that, it's, it's, you know, the sky's the limit. You can use any sort of, uh, combination of flavors that you, you want. I mean, there's a, you know, Berkston, uh, is a good example. They're a distillery out of Bergen that uses all kinds of foraged roots and berries, but they also use caraway. Um, and, uh, here in the States, there's a, a distillery in Portland called Rolling River that has, I think they make seven or eight different, um, iterations of aquavit and with all kinds of different botanicals, but they all either have caraway or dill or both. And, and in the U S until recently, um, the law, the, the TTB, uh, guidance or standards were that an aquavit had to have, uh, caraway. And just a couple of years ago, um, they updated their, their, I think it was an industry circular came out and said, well, actually they, they, they brought the standards in line with the EU standards, which they changed it. So you could use either dill seed or caraway or both. Um, so they, that's been the only change, but as far as a legal definition, there, there isn't much, uh, I, I, I imagine that anyone who's listening to this podcast is either, um, an industry uh, member, either a, a bar person or a uh, producer person, or they're a, you know a, a, a home enthusiast. And and if you're listening to this, you're probably would get a kick out of actually reading the the federal standards. And it's uh, you it, anyone can look it up for yourself at home. It's you can just Google the 27 CFR. Um, and chapter 5.22 is the standards of identity. So there's a lot of debate about what is what, what is a, how is bourbon defined or straight bourbon or whatever. It's like, well, it's all right there, the legal definitions. And the final, like the very last sentence in that whole section of the, of the code of federal regulation is, um, you know, Akavi, it lists a few, uh, a few spirits like Akavit, Iraq, uh, Schlivovitz, and so forth. And they can be made anywhere. They can be made in the U.S. And basically what it says is if it looks like a, you know, if it walks like an Akavit and it talks like an Akavit, it must be an Akavit, you know. And so that's, it's sort of a self-referential definition, but but it works. And and it leaves a lot of room for innovation and interpretation. And that's that's great. Yeah, I, I, I like that. In in many respects, I mean, I had a great conversation with Lance Winters from St. George about, um, you know, some some of these uh, standards of identity. Uh, our conversation was about us, uh, American, the American single malt category. And, you know, uh, but, you know, it seems it seems like you and he actually have kind of a similar mindset when it when it comes to that. And, and I think I think it's perfectly appropriate for an American spirit. I mean, maybe maybe that sort of approach wouldn't fly so much in Europe where they have uh, so many hundreds of years of a head start over us and uh, have been elbowing one another for borders and prestige and certain things for much longer than any of us have here in the U.S. But, um, you know, one of the things I want to come back to is, you know, first we want to talk about your like how you fell in love with Aquavit, but I, I have a feeling that we're going to return to Scandinavian cuisine and, you know, like the way that Aquavit is, is consumed. And, and so let's, let's just keep that in the clouds as, as we move on here. But, but yeah, why don't you tell us how you personally came to, to love this spirit? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I ever came to love it. It was just always part of my, you know, my life, you know, growing up, we were always, allowed to have a little bit of wine, a little bit of beer, a little bit of aquavit, a little bit of whiskey, uh, with, especially with meals. And that's really how traditionally that's how Scandinavians drink aquavit. Um, and that's kind of an interesting story. It's called, um, the little glasses and the little shots that you ha- have are called snops and the snop, a snop can be a little, uh, glass of aquavit. It can be a little glass of vodka. It can be a little glass of whatever, but typically it's going to be aquavit and it's something you drink with meal. And so it's a little snap, you know, it's a little, little shot. And, um, and that's why you'll typically see aquavit in the liqueur section in a, in a liquor store is because, you know, you know, 
30 years ago, the, a, a Swede would come in looking for Akavit and they'd say, well, snops, you know, where, where's your snops? And, and so people in, in sort of misinterpreted that as schnapps. And, and that's so today, you know, I think Akavit really belongs more in the gin section, but it's going to instead be next to the peppermint schnapps and stuff like that. You'll, that's typically where you find it. So that wow. is the tradition. Yeah. That is the tradition of drinking uh, Akavi, and and yeah, like you said, the the Scandinavian or the European uh, markets were so traditional, and you know, you could say hidebound. But what's interesting now is the, you know, the most popular, some of the most popular, innovative, the brands that you hear about are things like, you know, Brew Dogs in out of uh, England. You know, they're they are not traditional they're very innovative they're very much like an american craft brewery uh exported to the uk and and the the Akvid i just mentioned the barrackston he's not trying to make traditional you know norwegian Akvid. he's being innovative and so i think that that that's coming to you know that's happening in europe and and a lot of the traditional even traditional old scottish whiskey distilleries are having to really dig down and be innovative. And, and that's kind of fun to see. I think, you know, we're, we're having an influence on them. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with that. So one question I have before we dive into like, of course your Aquavit and, and how you went about developing that formulation is uh, so I, I think most Americans are familiar with dill as like a dried herb, mm-hmm. uh, but perhaps not with dill seed. So, so to your palate, you know, a caraway uh, is something I'm very familiar with. Um, obviously, it's those little seeds that tend to be on the outside of a nice rye bread. Uh, the cool thing about caraway is that it can be simultaneously nutty, minty, herbal, yeah. and uh, woody at the same time. It's this like revolutionarily complex yeah. flavor. Yeah. And that's what, but dill, yeah, yeah, that's what I, I love, and that's why we use the caraway and not the dill. The dill tends to be okay. um, more mm, monochromatic, I guess. It's got a single kind of direction of the flavor. It's more, I don't know. I kind of describe it as green. It tastes green, but um, mm-hmm. uh, whereas dill or a caraway, like you said, has this incredible like ephemeral character. It's like hard to put your finger on. Like just right, right when you think you can describe the flavor, then another flavor comes out, and 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 it's like using five different botanicals. Uh, you know, it's so complex. It's it's mm-hmm. uh, and and likewise, you know, the other botanical that we use in in Krogstad Akvit is star anise. You know, we don't use anise seed, but the star anise likewise has this incredibly complex flavor. It's not the, again, sing, it's not that monochromatic uh, uh, licorice that you get from fennel or from anise seed. It's, it's a much more complex, um, uh, really, um, I don't know, varied flavors. And so from these two botanicals uh, that we use, we get, just an incredibly complex and, and, and balanced, uh, flavor and character. So two botanicals, yeah, this is probably going to, it's, it's going to sound a little strange to many people listening, especially in that I know a lot of people have their gin glasses on right now. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> what was the process of developing that? Like, you know, because, because you know, I'll, I'll put, I'll put this out there first when developing a bitters formulation, for example, you have to deal with the fact that when you scale your formulation up, the effects of the botanicals and the herbs and spices that you use are going to act way different at different like maceration volumes. And so I'm wondering like star star anise is very intense. Uh, Caraway perhaps maybe a little easier to work with, but as you said, very ephemeral, like what was that development process like? And, And did you, did you, did you hit a winner early on or was it kind of like, were you constantly tweaking little knobs as you went? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a funny story. So we, we made it originally because, um, 
I, I'd never, it never occurred to me that there would be a, you know, a commercial, uh, uh, commercial viability for a, an American Akavit. It just, you know, uh, even after we started the distillery, but coming up to the holidays in 2006, um, the company that owns Linea, the Norwegian Akavit had bought Auborg, which is the Danish main Danish, uh, brand and and op anderson which is the main swedish export had been off the market for a year or two at that point and so coming up to the holidays in 2006 there was no akavit on the shelves in in oregon or washington uh just because of supply issues and supply chain stuff and and uh you know i kind of panicked a little bit it's like where am i going to get my akavit and it's like oh hell we've got a we've got a still why don't we make some and um we, you know, decided what kind of flavors we wanted and we did an experiment and the very first batch was fantastic. And basically, not basically, the recipe hasn't changed from our very first experimental batch. And whereas with, uh, with Aviation Gin, I think we had about 35 uh, test batches uh, to get it where we wanted. It took, you know, six months of, of development to get it just right. Uh, but with uh, Krogstad Akavit, it was just first, you know, first time. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, definitely, you know, it's an American Akavit. It's a little more bold than um, a Scandinavian. It tends to be a little more, you know, rich and, and flavorful, but it's at the same time very balanced and very pleasant it doesn't have any of those kind of harsh off flavors so i'm really happy with you know sometimes the first you know why go looking for more you know the first batch we did was fantastic and that's where you know we got lucky you know yeah i i'm really glad that you were willing to provide the uh the counterpoint from the aviation gin because that's a really cruel expectation to set oh yeah for anybody. oh yeah yeah no exactly and if you're if you're a craft if you're a uh, craft brewery, winery, distillery, whatever, you know, bitters maker, coffee roaster, baker, whatever. And if you are interested in innovation and if you want to bring something new, you, you have to accept that you're going to dump a lot of batches um, and you can't become emotionally attached to just because you made it doesn't mean it's good you know uh you know and so so we're you know i i and 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 this and also though that first batch wasn't intended for commercial use we just kept it at the distillery uh we taste it once in a while um when we had uh, visiting vips or journalists or bartenders uh we kind of trotted out and have them try it and see what they thought and uh and it was some of them that really and I was like one in particular, uh, Jim Meehan from New York, he tried it in, I think, two, you know, right after we made it in like late 2006, early 2007. And he's like, shit, you should bottle this. You know, if you bottle this, I'll buy it. And uh, so, yeah, he was true to his word. Uh, and then a couple months later, I visited him. At, he was the bar manager at Gramercy Tavern in New York. And he had three cocktails on the on the list with Craig at Akavit. It was, it was great. It was that's when I knew it was real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great validation from Jim Meehan. Yeah. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, well, speaking of cocktails, this is, I think this is a perfect, uh, point for us to talk about the applications of Aquavit in the cocktail space, uh, because I know that the logical move is obviously to, to use it in a gin application. Uh, but you know, the, the thing about, Aquavit is doesn't necessarily, and, and I'm guessing in most cases, it just doesn't contain juniper. And and so I, I part of me thinks that, yeah, that's a smart move. It's a botanical spirit. But another part of me thinks like, you know, what am I, what am I missing? Like, what, what am I not getting? So, so being someone who's been, you know, way, way more versed in this than I, how do you think about using your Aquavit or perhaps Aquavit in general in a cocktail application? You know, it's, it is, there is a tendency to, to use it in gin cocktails. And, and actually it, uh, some of my favorite, uh, Aquavit cocktails are, are takes, are a spin on, on gin drinks. And for instance, 
you know, I would say one of my, one of, you know, I'm not alone in this. One of my favorite all time drinks is the Negroni. You know, it's, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not always original. And, uh, but, uh, with the Krogstad Akavit, it's it just a really interesting, very herbal um, rendition. Uh, it's it's less sweet, more savory, and that's so that's kind of what comes through then in in other you know, like I said, classic gin drinks. Um, you know, there's a drink that we call a Super Trooper. Uh, we named that after an ABBA song, and uh, it's basically just a uh, bee's knees uh, with uh, Krogstad Akavit instead of uh, gin, and it's fantastic. So there's a lot um, of substitution, and and you know, as if if you're gonna develop, um, if you want to play around with uh, Akavit cocktails at home or in a bar or wherever, um, and, and you haven't done it. I think that that's a great way to just get a sense for how how it is different is is take a take a, a popular gin drink and and uh, sub sub Akavit. and some it works better than others it's great in the last word um, you know going back I think you know one of the most obvious things to do with with an Aquavit uh, is in a Bloody Mary I mean that's just sort of a that's something that's been around since the seventies. Uh, uh, Auborg, the Danish brand had a campaign in the early seventies to get people to make, uh, they called them Danish Marys or something like that. Uh, and it was, it was a thing for a little while and, and, you know, but it's, it's true. It works really well. Uh, you know, vodka adds a little structure to a drink, but it doesn't really add any flavor or texture or anything like that. Whereas, you know, subbing out, the vodka for uh, with uh, Akavit, uh, you know, especially Krogstad Akavit, just gives it this intense herbal quality that really plays well with the uh, the tomato and and other spices. So try that. Um, but then I guess you know you're like, then where do you go from there, right? So the first thing you do is the obvious things that you know the Bloody Mary. The next thing you do is sub out some. Uh, gin drinks but when we first when we first bottled this um i sent a, a couple bottle a uh, few bottles down to a friend of mine who uh, at the time was working at a, a tiki bar in um on alameda island called forbidden island and uh, this guy martin kate who then subsequently started uh smuggler's cove smuggler's cove and he sent me back five or six and this is in like 2006 or maybe early 2007, sent me back five or six tiki drinks with uh, using Krogstad Akavit. And they were fantastic. And, and in fact, at Smuggler's Cove from day one, uh, he always had the, uh, a drink called the Norwegian Paralysis on his list. One of the only handful of drinks on the list that were made from uh, something other than rum as the base. And... Um, you know, you look at his cocktail book or you look at, you know, Meehan's, you know, PDT book. And there's, you know, quite a few. Uh, I'm really, you know, proud of that, that, you know, we have we appear in, you know, so many of the great, class, you know, modern classic bar books. But so that's a that's a trend that um, I as far as I can tell, as far as I've been able to see, that was really started by Martin Kate just tasting our Akavit and thinking, wow, this would be really good in tiki drinks. And then, you know, some other folks have, have played with that since, um, you know, around the country. So, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, Martin was the first, but we've done some events in New York and, you know, uh, Viking tiki competitions. And it's really fun to see, you know, the kind of qualities you get, um, kind of flavors that, rise from that. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to take a, just a moment to zoom in on a few of the things you said about these cocktails and I'm going to try and go in order here. Um, uh, the Negroni, yeah. uh, obviously, you know, that, that would be the first thing that I would try it in, to be honest. I think that's a, that's a really good move. And I think the cool thing about your Aquavit in particular, obviously the emphasis on the caraway. One of the things that 
I get caraway notes in on a regular basis is rye whiskey uh, when I'm just tasting. And so rye whiskey, Boulevardier, Negroni format. So here you have something that acts like a gin, but also has some notes that may be in common with a, a rye. And so uh, natural to pick a format in which both of those spirits can be used sort of interchangeably. Um, so the Negroni to me makes complete sense. Um, the bee's knees. Uh, I th One of the things my dad does is he'll like, uh, for allergies or something, he'll take like a, a like a teaspoon of honey and sprinkle some cinnamon on it. So I thought cinnamon, honey, star anise has some of those cinnamon like qualities. Suddenly you're talking about a bee's knees with a honey syrup. Okay, here we go. Like there's there's some touch points in the bee's knees format as well. The Bloody Mary. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, you mentioned your Aquavit, but I immediately thought of the dill seed, you know, so if you're featuring something that has more of like a dill seed flavor profile, that is going to move into those sort of umami green types of spaces where you might find some really nice flavor accords in the Bloody Mary format. And then of course, in the tiki world, well, one of the things that we find in a lot of tiki drinks in the order of about a teaspoon uh, or a bar spoon is something like Pernod or uh, like a, an absinthe or an absinthe substitute. And so some of these notes in the Aquavits are going to be, if not like right there, like in like orbiting that, like you said, with the instead of like the um, the anise seed, you know, you're using the star anise, but like that's very much an absinthe quality. So I, it's it's really nice to in all of those cocktails that you just offered, see that there is not only like a um, like a logical home, but sort of like a, a, an emotional home for Aquavit in, in all these cocktail formats. And and in that respect, I, I think it's it's fantastic. Um any food pairing recommendations before we we tell folks how they uh, can maybe um, foster an Aquavit passion here in the U.S.? Yeah, well, you know, I can say that I have turned more people on to pickled herring than uh, than <laughs> just about anyone. So Aquavit, uh, especially the, the again, especially the Cogstad Aquavit, is a fantastic palate cleanser. That caraway just really kind of scrubs your palate uh, if you're having any, you know, the so the the neat, you know, neat, maybe slightly chilled or, you know, uh, um, uh, on the rocks. Uh, Croxodocvi is fantastic with certain strong uh, or oily fish like mackerel. Uh, so it really has a great place in, in that sort of application. If you if you want to, you know, you tend to when you have a piece of pickled herring or a you know a grilled grilled mackerel or something that tends to be what you taste for the next several minutes, uh, and so it affects everything else that you're you're tasting. Whereas, you know, if you have a little snops uh, of um, of aquavit, uh, it it really kind of resets your palate. Uh, so it's, it's really good for that. Um, you know, so the, the obvious and, you know, like I said, really sort of mind expanding, um, application is, um, you know, oysters on the half shell or, um, you know, sushi it's fantastic with, uh, saba, you know, grilled mackerel, um, you know, with daikon, that classic Japanese dish, or uh, or you know pickled herring. Like I said, it's it's uh, a lot of people who think they don't like pickled herring actually do if they have it with the right pairing. Um, yeah. And then as, in terms of cocktails, I mean, it just depends on um, uh, you know. I think a cocktail is almost sort of like a meal unto itself. So uh, you know, a Bloody Mary is kind of a meal. Um, and a you know a bloody Viking or a whatever you want to call it an Aquavit Bloody Mary is 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 a meal and and you know some of these cocktail I think that does make you know Aquavit cocktails do make great food pairings because in in cocktails because they they are typically a little more savory rather than sweet. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, well, that's fantastic. Um, Christian, before we jump into the lightning round here, I was hoping that, you know, since this is a, I mean, obviously you are an American producer, but you're obviously well acquainted with uh, sort of the international trends uh, of Aquavit. So I'm wondering if, if anybody who's listening right now wanted to um, locate Aquavit in their home market, it being maybe one of the less common spirits categories do you have any like pro tips or hacks of like how to figure that out in your market um wherever you may be well you know um, it's surprising how many stores will have a dusty bottle of aquavit somewhere i mean it's it's been around forever uh you know the scandinavians get around and they always ask for it with, if they're living in a, a place so there's a good chance that your store already has some brand of Akavit. And, you know, they, if you ask for it, they, you know, their stores are in the business of, of satisfying their customers. So, you know, for, for instance, you know, we're distributed in, in most states, almost every state in the country. Uh, that doesn't mean we're in every store, but we're available in every state. And, and we're, we're with the big distributors. We're with, you know, Breakthrough Beverage Group in, in a lot of states, like in D.C., Maryland, we're with Breakthrough. Um, in most of the rest of the country, we're with Southern Glazers, which is you know the the larger uh, distributor group. Uh, but if you want it, you know right away, we're also on Caskers, so you can get it delivered to you, you know, in two days or whatever. Going to Caskers uh, website, Caskers.com, I guess it is. Uh, so. Yeah, it's not that hard to get if you know about it and you know you want it. Um, it's out there for sure. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, one of the things that we're scaling this year is some themed tastings on our live stream. So we'll have to, uh, in the coming months, as I'm able to uh, source some bottles, both from you and from some other producers, we'll have to do like a themed Aquavit yeah. tasting so that maybe we can compare and contrast, get a couple from the U.S., yeah. a couple from Europe. And uh, yeah, so we'll de we'll definitely uh, tag you and, and you can check out that tasting. But it's definitely, it's on my list. It's just going to be in a couple months as I I can source these things because it's not, not everything is easier during the pandemic. In <laughs> fact, most things are harder. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'll, I'll send you yeah, some that, pickled herring for that. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm in. Um, all right, Christian, anything you want to, um, just wrap up with before we jump into the lightning round here? Um, gosh, you know, I, um, I think we're, we're, we're covering a lot of good territory. So, um, no, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, uh, you know, it's a category that not a lot of people there that rather that a lot of people aren't familiar with and, uh, you should check it out. Yeah. Um, uh, one last plug you may see if you're here in the DC region, uh, green hat gin did a, uh, Aquavi style gin called Genevieve. <laughs> um, and so it's obviously still got the, the juniper in it. I, I don't know when last they did a run of this particular product because it's not one of their more common releases. But you may also, if you're here in the DMV region, see that kicking around. So that, that you know, could also be an interesting entree into it. I remember when I had a bottle of that, I made some gravlocks with it and, uh, you know, took some took some salmon and some dill and made a, a nice little meal with that and did some cocktail pairing. So um, with that, here we go with some lightning round questions. Uh, Christian, you, you've already mentioned the Negroni, so maybe maybe we, we're covering already trodden territory, but what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something maybe you've been more recently obsessed with? Um, you know, I love, I, I really uh, have have enjoyed recently the uh, Corpse Reviver number two, but using the uh, Krugsaw, because, you know, Corpse Reviver number two, classically made with uh, gin, you know, you'll see the recipe in like uh, Ted Hayes, um, forgotten, or forgotten spirits and no forgotten spirits and classic cocktails, something like that. But uh, you know, it uses a couple drops of absinthe or Pernod, uh on top or in the rim. Um, but again, this is an exam a great example of, you know, getting your, uh, that licorice quality from, from the, uh, from the uh, Aquavit, uh, but also it's just like this really great balanced cocktail, a sort of dry, but not drying, if you know what I mean. It's not sweet, it's 
uh, more on the dry side, but it's not, but it's, but it's very drinkable. It's, you know, um, mm -hmm. so I would say let's try, try a corpse survivor number two. Yeah. And I believe, is that an equal part yeah, as well? Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. yeah Lille Blanc, uh, Cointreau, um, Corkstock Vite, um, and lemon juice. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's like there's something really satisfying when a cocktail is like is both like a, a sex sexy on a blackboard or mm -hmm. sexy on a whiteboard when you're looking at the formulation. And then when you taste it, it also has like that sort of like really interesting, mm -hmm. like simple, but also complex, but not in your face complex. It's like, yeah, I love the Corpse Survivor number two yeah. as well. Uh, are there any uh, underrated spirits or cocktail trends right now, aside from Aquavit, uh, that you think uh, more people should be paying attention to? Um, gosh, you know, uh, I've been really kind of getting into some of the bourbon, you know, sort of craft bourbons made with some of the heirloom uh, corn varieties, uh, in particular, like... Uh, uh, high, uh, high wire distilling down in Charleston, uh, South Carolina is doing a, they're growing Jimmy red corn, which is a, a variety that almost disappeared. And it's this very intensely oily corn. Um, uh, but really great flavor of, it's almost like biscuits. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, so I think, mm. you know, I think a, a whiskey trend that I'm really loving is getting away from the commodity uh grains and getting into more heirloom varieties whether it's a single malt or a bourbon rye whatever and you know because so many of those you know so many of the commodity varieties almost have the flavor bred out of them um and so many of the heirloom varieties have just really interesting flavors so i guess that's something i would say kind of heirloom Heirloom ingredients, old old style. Yeah. Well, and kudos to those distillers who try and work with that uh, without some sort of template in front of them as well. Because like as much as the flavor is bred out of the commodity stuff, you have to assume that the sugar is bred into it. Yeah. So it's easy to ferment. It's easy to mash, yeah. um, especially when you're talking corn. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was recently, not, not three months ago, I was on a combine uh videotaping somebody harvesting bloody butcher corn here in uh, Western Maryland. And, um, it, you know, if you are a distiller uh, listening or if you are someone who, you know, is involved in the sourcing or distilling of grains, um, there are farmers out there who are interested in working this stuff into their crop rotation, especially if they're farming multiple plots of land. There's, there's value in bringing a new type of grain to the mix because that allows them to get more creative with their crop rotation patterns. And so, so yeah, uh, couldn't agree more on the, uh, the heirloom and the, the interesting flavor side of things, but it's not easy for the distillers. There's a lot of trial and error there. Yeah, that's what's fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you could have a cocktail with anybody past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us uh, an imaginary picture here. You know, uh, I would really be interested in uh, learning Stephen Hawkins' uh, take on, uh, you know, the Corpse Survivor number two, especially back, uh, you know, in his college days, in his wild college days before he uh, started, you know, losing uh, some of his muscle control and stuff. Uh, he would have been a, uh, I just can't imagine what the kind of crazy stuff that would come out of his mouth. Um, it would have to be pretty fascinating. So, you know, I think going to a college pub with Stephen Hawking and having a beer and maybe a cocktail would, would be pretty cool. Yeah, totally. That's a great answer. Uh, it's amazing how many people choose physicists for that answer. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, physicists are very I popular. Feel, you're making me feel unoriginal now. I'll come up with something else. Give me a second. <laughs> No, no, no. It's it, it. Well, no one has said Stephen Hawking oh, before, oh. but you know, it's 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 funny that you know, like Matt Matt Petrick was uh, it was uh, you know, I think he said, uh, oh, I want to you know talk calculus with Newton, for example, and you know, so it's it's yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah. That there's definitely we'll have to dig into that once I have a, a large enough bolus of answers about physicists. But um, uh, f 
finally, to wrap up the lightning round here, I just I wanted to ask if there are any unusual or perhaps controversial views that you hold in the spirits and cocktail world. And you don't have to yeah. you don't have to you know you don't have to piss anybody off here. But if there's something that's not going to get you in trouble, we'd love no, to hear. I'm, it. I'm not I'm not uh, afraid of making enemies. Um, so that's a very Viking thing to say. <laughs> so uh, you know you you're familiar with shochu. You know you take some grain and you add um, an enzyme from uh, aspergillus. You, you put the koji mold on it. The koji converts the starch to sugar. Uh, so this is the, you know, this is the uh, sort of the Eastern uh, tradition. Whereas in the West, we, we would malt, we would sprout the grains and, um, uh, and the sprouting produces the enzymes internally that that convert the starch to, to sugar. And, and so, you know, in making um, shochu, they'll, you know, they'll add this koji mold and then they'll add the yeast. The koji is converting the starch to sugar. The yeast is then eating the sugar to produce alcohol. And in some case, and then they'll distill it. And in some cases they'll um, uh, barrel age it. So like a kusu is a kusu is a, a barrel aged uh, rice, uh, uh, you know, awamori, rice, uh, shochu. And so, you know, if you are making, say, bourbon uh, with sprouted grains, malt, whatever, you know, that's a traditional Western, um, Western whiskey. But if you are using an enzyme, an exogenous enzyme, especially derived from koji, that's not bourbon, you're making shochu. You're making an American corn uh, barrel aged shochu. So. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, you, I like that. So think that over for a little while. You know, you can, we can come back to mm-hmm. that. Yeah, that 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 is interesting. I think I see where you're going with that. I I, I, I do think I see where you're going with it. Uh, I'll have to run that by some of the bourbon people yeah, in my please life. Do. And, please do. And, Report and back. And see what they say. Yeah. I, w- I will. That's uh, like yeah. I can see how I'll talk it over with them. I I could see how that might irritate some people, but that's that's interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love I love talking process. Um, well, Christian, this has been tremendous, man. I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope that everybody, especially on uh, on this coast, uh, has a chance to uh, begin looking into your products beyond the aviation gin, which they've probably already come across uh, many times. Uh, but, um, yeah, just, uh, as we, as we sign off here, can, can you tell us how best to reach out to you in the digital space? And, um, uh, we've already gone over distributors, but, uh, is there, is there anywhere else to learn about the products that, that you and your company create? Yeah. So we, you know, we have a website, uh, Krogstad Akavit.com. So K R O G S T A D Akavit, A Q U A V I T Krogstad Akavit.com. We are also on, you know, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I think Twitter too, but I don't really tweet personally, but, um, you know, Instagram is, is a great place to look for us. And there's, there's all kinds of great cocktail recipes on Instagram and, and, and on our, our, uh, website. Um, and you know, you can always Google us. There's, uh, there's some good info, info about us. So yeah, reach out. Uh, you can contact me through any of those, uh, sites and I'll get back to you. And if you've got questions, I'd love to continue the the conversation offline awesome and the overall brand is house spirits correct the, yeah we don't really use that anymore though um so oh, okay. the individual each individual brand has its own you know personality its own identity uh house there's no one thing that's branded as house spirits that's the name of the distillery cool yeah so we'll uh we'll have links to all of that we'll have uh links to the uh the federal standard of identity yeah. we'll have links to all all the stuff that we talked about here on the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast and christian thanks so much for being our guest yeah thanks for having me it was really fun Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. 
other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was produced by Edie Frederick with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, Aquavit expertise by Christian Krogstad, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.